Well, good afternoon, friends. It is such a pleasure always for me to be with you. I love standing together with friends of the same convictions, standing together across the Atlantic for the truth of the gospel. And it is a particular pleasure now to lift up and celebrate three truths about God, truths that were and are so very close to R.C.'s heart. We're going to look together now at God's self-existence, His divine simplicity, and thirdly, His immutability. Now, those truths may not immediately sound thrilling to you. <laughs> and you may wonder why R.C. treasured them as he most surely did. But what R.C. very clearly saw, and what I hope we will see, is that these truths uphold the very beauty of God's glory and holiness. And that the gospel of grace flows from these truths about God. These truths about God and the graciousness of the gospel stand together. Indeed, without these truths, you will not marvel deeply at God. You will not know just how gracious He is, and you will not trust Him so eagerly. So let's look first at God's self-existence, sometimes known as the doctrine of God's aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, aseity. It comes from the Latin ase, meaning uh, from or of Himself. And uh, many of you may remember, I wonder if you ever got the chance to hear R.C. talk about God's aseity. And when he'd start getting into the subject of God's aseity, you, you could just see his eyes light up. You, you could just almost watch this tremble of excitement start to go through his body. And I want us to see why. Well, this is a doctrine that flows from the divine name itself. When in Exodus 3, Moses asks God, what is your name? God answers, I am who I am. Say to this people, I am has sent me to you. In other words, God does not receive his name, his identity, or his existence from anyone or anything else. He does not depend on anything to be who he is. He simply and eternally is. This is why in John 1, John introduces the Word who is God, and immediately writes, in Him was life. He doesn't write, He had or He acquired life. No, in Him was life. Four chapters later, John 5, 26, Jesus Himself will put it like this, the Father has life in Himself. And so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself, for the Son is the great I Am. Before Abraham was, I Am. And that being the case, Paul can tell the Athenians in Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is He served by human hands, as though He needed anything, 
No, the God who created the world isn't in any need. He depends on nothing. He has life in himself. He has fullness of being in himself. All of which completely sets him apart from the idols. I wonder if you remember in Acts 19 in Ephesus, do you remember Demetrius the idol maker? He makes a complaint, and I wonder if you remember what it is. He, he's complaining that if Paul is allowed to say that man-made gods are no gods at all, he says, if Paul's allowed to say that, there is a danger that not only our trade will lose its good name, this is Acts 19, 27, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and here's the kicker, get this, get this for an admission, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Oh dear, what an admission. Oops. In other words, all that divine majesty of Artemis is dependent on the service of her worshippers. Oh dear, in herself, she sounds empty and parasitic. For all her apparent magnificence, she needs her minions. And it wasn't just the traditional gods of paganism that had this problem. In the fourth century BC, the Athenian philosopher Aristotle wrestled with this question. He thought, how can we say that God is eternally and essentially good? Because goodness means being good to another. And his answer was, okay, work with Aristotle here, try to see his logic. God is eternally the uncaused cause. That's who he is, says Aristotle. Therefore, if he is eternally the uncaused cause, he must eternally cause the creation to exist. Eternally. Meaning, do you see it? The universe must be eternal. And that way, God can be truly and eternally good because the universe eternally exists alongside him and he's eternally good to it. So Aristotle's God is eternally self-giving and good because he's eternally self-giving and good to the universe. Ingenious, right? It's Aristotle. Do you see the problem? It means just like with Artemis. For Aristotle's God to be himself he needs the world. He can't be good without a world to be good to. He is essentially dependent on the world to be who he is. And today, Islam suffers from the same problem. Traditionally, Allah is said to have 99 names which describe him as he is in himself in eternity. And one of those names could be translated something like the loving. Now, have a think about this. How could Allah, eternally alone, be eternally called loving? This doesn't refer to self-centered love. It, it's about uh, love for others. H how could that be true eternally of Allah? See the problem? He's called eternally loving, but there's nothing, no one for him to love before creation. And so some scholars have suggested, well, that's because Allah eternally loves his creation. Even in prospect, he looks forward to it. He, he loves his creation. So he eternally loves his creation, and therefore he can be called eternally the loving. Spot the same old problem. If Allah needs his creation to be who he is, 
in himself, e.g. loving, Allah is dependent on his creation. It is just one of those points of internal inconsistency in Islam. In absolute contrast, Orthodox Christians have never thought that God created because he needed to. God is not lonely or bored without us. Here's how the great Puritan preacher Richard Sibbs put it. He said, if God did not have a communicative spreading goodness, he would never have created the world. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were happy in themselves and enjoyed one another before the world was. Apart from the fact that God delights to spread His goodness, there would never have been a creation or redemption. Sibs is saying God didn't need to create the world in order to satisfy Himself or to be Himself. The divine majesty of this God is not dependent on the world. The Father, Son, and Spirit were happy in themselves, enjoyed one another before the world was. So, Sibs, why did God create them? Well, Sibs said, God is like a warming sun of life who delights to spread his beams. Such a goodness is in God, he said, as is in a fountain or in the breast that loves to ease itself of milk. In other words, God didn't create because he needed to, because of any lack. He created because he was so happily self-existent. He was so bursting with life and goodness in himself. God is so overflowingly, super abundantly full of life in himself that he delighted to spread his goodness. Because of God's blessed, should we use that word again, aseity, we can know the very creation is a work of grace. Grace, then, is not merely his kindness to sinners. Before even there was sin, God brought his creation into being out of grace. With the self-existent God, love is not a reaction. God's love is proactive, creative. He gives life and being as a free gift because his very life, being, and goodness is yeasty, spreading out that there might be more that is truly good, overflowing. It's why in Scripture the glory of God is so often spoken of as a radiant light shining outwards, enlightening, giving life. Arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The shepherds outside Bethlehem, they were watching their flocks, and then the glory of the Lord shone around them. This radiant, shining light in the New Jerusalem, we read, the city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. The Lamb is its lamp. Because needing nothing, this God is so happily self-existent, He is the opposite of all man-made gods. All false gods are black holes of neediness, taking, grasping. The living God is 
innermost being is a sun of light and life and warmth, always shining out, radiant, outgoing, so full of life in himself. Let's keep on the idea of God's glory. Think of what we see in Jesus, the Son of God, the one Hebrews describes as the radiance of God's glory. Going out from the Father in grace, He shows us the very nature of God. And He does so supremely in what He calls the hour of His glorification, the glorification of of the glory of God. In John 12, Jesus announces, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And what does he mean? John 12, 23, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies. It produces many seeds. You see what he's saying? Jesus is about to be glorified. And what does that look like? A seed dying to bear fruit. But he was speaking of his death. On the cross, we see the deepest revelation of the very heart of God of this God, and it is all about laying down his life to give life, for his glory is fruitful. The glory of the cross is a glory no other God would want. Other gods, they need worship and service and sustenance. This God needs nothing. He has life in himself, and so much so he's brimming over. His glory is overflowing, self-giving. I wonder if you know C.S. Lewis screw tape letters, in which he imagines a series of letters written from a senior to a junior demon. Now, Lewis doesn't get everything right. And in good part because he's an Oxford man. <laughs> uh, I, I went to the better university, and I'm just a missionary to that dark city in Oxford. <laughs> but Lewis does capture well the difference between the devil, who is the definitive needy God, and the living God of ecstatic, self-giving, overflowing love. So let me read you what Screwtape writes. <clears throat> Screwtape says, one must face the fact that all God's talk about his love for men, his service being perfect freedom, is not, as we demons would gladly believe, mere propaganda. It is an appalling truth. He really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself creatures whose life on its miniature scale will be qualitatively like his own, not because he's absorbed them, but because their wills freely conform to his. We demons want cattle who can finally become food. He wants sons. We want to suck in. He wants to give out. We are empty and would be filled. He is full and flows over. And the tragedy is that so many think the living God is the devilish one, as if he created us simply to get, to demand, to take from us. But the contrast between the devil and the self-existent God could not be starker. The devil and all false gods are empty, hungry, grasping, envious. The self-existent God is superabundant, generous, radiant, self-giving. And I hope 
it's starting to become obvious why God's self-existence is the only foundation on which a true gospel of grace can be built. Because it means with this God, He's not hungrily looking to find some goodness in us to satisfy Himself. He's, he's not looking for some loveliness He desperately needs. He does not love us because of any loveliness in us. No, He creates it. Here's how Martin Luther put it. The love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of God loves sinners, evil persons, fools, weaklings, in order to make them righteous, good, wise, and strong. Rather than seeking its own, the love of God flows forth and bestows good. And therefore, sinners are attractive because they're loved. They're not loved because they've made themselves attractive. It is precisely because God is self-existent, because He does not need us, that He relates to us by sheer grace. No other God can do that. And if you are the sort of person that's tempted to think that by the greatness of your service, you are doing God a favor, Remember, he does not need you. All your service, your ministry, is your joy and privilege to be brought into his life. He does not need you. The burden is all on him, not on you. He doesn't need you. He relates to you by sheer grace. Now, Jonathan Edwards once preached a sermon on what this means for Christian living. Jonathan Edwards, the great British theologian. He... Uh, it wasn't a joke. <laughs> Edwards argued that because God is not reactive, but proactive in his love. He said, so Christians should be proactive in their love. Edward said, true religion is a thing of a very active nature. It is most like the divine being's nature, which is infinitely active, indeed pure act. So that's the first truth, God's self-existence. The second truth we're going to look at, divine simplicity, is really about reinforcing that first truth. Divine simplicity means that just as God does not depend on anything outside Himself, so in Himself He does not have any parts that he depends on in order to be who he is. In other words, God does not derive his being from any quality or idea or thing that you could separate from him or that might pre-exist him. Put it like this, God does not have some thing called love or holiness or goodness as, those, as though those were removable organs that you could transplant out of him. No, God is love. He is goodness itself, truth itself, beauty itself, holiness itself. So goodness, for example, is not some external standard he tries to emulate. He is goodness. God has no parts on which he depends. He is simple. He's not a compound. So, we talk about different attributes of God, but it's not as if 
holiness and righteousness and justice, etc., are like different ingredients we can smash together and produce this compound called God. The Christians often do speak like that. Christians often seem to speak of the divine attributes as if they were divine flavors that sometimes sit uncomfortably next to each other. You're, you know this sort of thing? For example, how often have you heard Christians say, yes, God is loving, but He is also wrathful? And I know what they mean. And, and I think they're right in what they're meaning, but it can sound, by phrasing it like that, as if love and wrath are different moods, so that when he's feeling one, he's not feeling the other. But these are not separable parts, as if sometimes God has love and sometimes He has wrath. No, God is angry at evil because He loves it is proof of the sincerity of his love, that he truly cares, that his love is not mild-mannered and limp. It is livid, potent, committed. And therein lies our hope that through his wrath, the living God shows he's truly loving and he will destroy all devilry so that we will enjoy him in a purified world, the home of righteousness. God is simple. He has no parts. But you may say, hang on. What about the Trinity? Hmm? God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Is that not three parts to God? A? Eh? Very importantly, no. God does not have three things called Father, Son, and Spirit. God is Father, Son, and Spirit. At which point you're probably starting to feel, ah, this really is a Brit getting fussy with his grammar. I wish they would chill out. Let me show you, it really does make all the difference. So imagine, imagine this. Imagine Father, Son, and Spirit are just three parts, three qualities God has chosen to adopt. Well, if that's the case, deep down the Father is not fatherly. In that case, He simply at some point decided to start acting fatherly, in which case the Father's not loved the Son for eternity, in which case God is not eternally love. Oops. See, the whole character of God has changed. That is not what we see in Scripture. Think John 17, 24. Jesus says, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. The eternal Son, who according to Colossians 1 is before all things, before all things, the one through whom all things were created, the one Hebrews calls Lord and God who laid the foundations of the earth. He is loved by the Father before the creation of the world. So the Father then is eternally the Father of the eternal Son. He finds His identity, His fatherhood in loving His Son. So it is not as if God the Father is something else underneath and at some point chose to be father. It's not like he has a nice blob of fatherly icing on top. He, no, he is father all the way down. And for that to be true, for him to be eternally father, he must eternally have a son. All of which leads us on to our third connected truth, immutability. Yes, I know we're going fast. I didn't write the schedule. God's immutability, number three. It means... God does not evolve or improve. Having fullness of being, how could He? He isn't fickle. He isn't in some mood He might move on from. He doesn't become something else. God 
is eternally and faithfully and gloriously himself. And so it is not as if God could ever have become Father, Son, and Spirit. It is not as if God the Father was once on his own and got lonely and decided to have a son to keep him company. If that were it, we'd think, poor old God. What a needy thing he'd be. He, he would not be love. He'd be a God in search of love. Do you see, only an empty, lacking God needs to self-improve. But such a God would be a completely different sort of being. If there was once a time when the sun did, didn't exist, was brought into existence, if there was that change, then there was once a time when the father wasn't a father. And if that's the case, once upon a time, God was not loving since he had nobody to love. No, God did not become father at some point. There was no change. Rather, the father's very identity is to be the one who eternally begets the son. That's who he is. It's not as if the father and the son bumped into each other at some point, found they got on remarkably well, decided to become a family. The father is who he is by virtue of his relationship with his son, who he loves through the spirit. The son would not be the son without the father. And to illustrate, Sibs did this, many theologians have liked to use the image of a fountain to talk about the Father, a fountain ever bursting out with love. It's a scriptural image, Jeremiah 2.13, the Lord calls himself a spring of living water. And the reason they chose this image is because just as a fountain, to be a fountain, must pour forth water, so the Father, to be Father, must be begetting His Son. That is who He is. That is His fundamental, eternal identity, meaning love is not something He has, merely one of His moods. He is love. He could not not love. If He didn't love, He wouldn't be Father. Do you see it, friends? The self-existent, simple, immutable nature of God means here is the only God who is not lacking, who is inherently loving, outgoing, overflowingly abundant. Here is the only God who could be inclined to be gracious. Here is the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, we may be lacking. We may be day to day, up and down. Hour by hour, up and down. But He is constant. He is trustworthy. Unlike the idols, He needs nothing. He acts with his own reliable, inherent graciousness. He has no secret, needy agenda. And this means we can turn always with confidence to him. And we can turn to him with wonder at His eternal fullness and magnificence. He is, day after day, a strong tower. And you know, it has been just this constancy of being so radiantly Himself that has been the comfort of the saints through the ages. Think of the young John Bunyan. John Bunyan, his own inconstancy was precisely what drove him to despair. In his autobiography, 
grace abounding. Bunyan said, in his youth, he used to be full of despair when he thought of heaven and hell. He said he believed it was too late for me to look after heaven for Christ would not forgive me. And he tried to do better and my peace would be in and out in constant. Sometimes 20 times a day, he said, comfort now, trouble presently. But he wrote, one day I was walking in the field with some dashes on my conscience, fearing all was not right. And suddenly, this sentence fell on my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And methought with all, I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, is my righteousness. So that wherever I was, whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, Bunyan lacks my righteousness, because my righteousness was just before him. I saw, moreover, it was not my good state of heart that made my righteousness better, nor my bad state of heart that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs. Indeed, I was loosed from my afflictions. My temptations fled away so that from that time those dreadful scriptures of God left off to trouble me now, and I went home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, our righteousness in Him is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our comfort and the graciousness of the gospel is built on these characters of God, on these perfections of God. Friends, only with this God can we fickle needy people know constancy of comfort and constancy of wonder-filled adoration. Let's pray. Father, your self-existent blessedness, your complete lack of dependence on us or on anything else makes us bow our hearts and our minds in wonder and fills us with comfort. Blessed be your name from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.